So, hello. Is that, can everyone hear yeah, what I sound? Hello, Right, right this close, okay. Oh yeah, that's quite strange, this one. Yeah. Hi everyone, um, my name's Sai. I'm from the uh, Justice Group of Extinction Rebellion um, in Sheffield. And what we're going to try and do today is something called Pass the Mic, uh, where we're going to try and allow some voices from the Global South uh, to be heard and to be amplified and to talk about um, <coughs> the issues that are concerning them. Because as our G7 leaders, the, self, the leading countries of the industrialised northern world meet, you can be pretty sure that they're not going to be giving too much consideration to those who are on the front line of the climate and ecological emergency. So we're doing this because the people in the Global South are screaming to be heard and yet our cameras and our microphones are not turned in their direction even when they drown on the shores of our coastline. We're doing this because environmentalists in the Global South are on the front line of the global climate emergency and they pay with their lives for the actions that they take against our multinational companies from the Global North who are supported by our governments, the G7 leaders and frequently a corrupt local elite. And our G7 leaders are meeting today to ensure that the rules that protect this extractive system remain strong and protect those extractors, those polluters, even as they transition to alternative power sources. And the voice of the Global South will not be heard. We have seen that with the scandal of the vaccine program and the way in which the vaccines have been kept in the Global North and failed to be distributed fairly to the Global South. And we see that with the cut in the aid budget at a time when that money cannot be considered as anything other than essential. At this point, I would like to pass the mic to a young British Asian woman who speaks on behalf of the uh, Indian farmers' protest um, in India. And it's a great regret that very short notice she's been unable to attend. So I'm going to do my best to give a little bit of information as to what she might have been saying and to talk a little bit about that farmer's protest. It's a um, action in India which is the largest demonstration, the largest protest in world history. It cannot be underestimated the size and the significance of 250 million people engaged in action, in protection of livelihoods, in protection of um, agriculture and farming systems, and in protection of uh, the, ultimately the environment. Um, so it's an action which is against Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who was invited by Boris Johnson to be part of that G7 delegation. His presence would have been strongly opposed, for he represents a very sinister voice, and he's pursuing a vicious program of tax against all opposition, and particularly against Muslims, and particularly against Sikhs. And he has locked down Kashmir from the rest of the world while he has undertaken the most bloody repression behind closed doors. And his, pursue, his reason for not being here is because of his own pursuit of his COVID strategy, which has seen India suffer the highest rate of infections and deaths in an apocalyptic surge this spring. Yet Johnson was prepared to invite this person to, uh, <coughs> to Britain. Um, as a part of a G7. So the Indian farmers, let us be absolutely clear, success of the Indian farmers' protest is critical in the fight for justice 
in the global south, but is also central to the fight to protect climate and biodiversity. Modi is offering the world's largest multinationals, such as Cargill from the USA, and India's own global players, such as the Adani Group, an opportunity to force small-scale farmers off the land, set prices, and to generate the profits for the few at the great expense of the many. And as farmers, as farms fail, the land will be brought up by finance companies. Agriculture will be financialised and finance will be agriculturalised. So what we will see is the adoption of the agribusiness model of monoculture crops, genetic engineering, genetic enhanced seeds, fertilisers produced with fossil fuels and pesticides. And then there's going to be data harvesters. Google, Facebook, uh, Amazon are all in on the process to exploit and extract from the agricultural model in India. And this will lead to huge potential changes in food security, biodiversity, rural livelihoods and soils. And there will not be the jobs for those farmers forced off the land. There haven't been in the last 30 years, which is why there's such an epidemic of suicide amongst Indian farmers. So we're going to be amplifying the voice of a small-scale farmer everywhere, challenging the dominance of the agricultural industrial farming system, challenging the likes of Bill Gates who's proposing ever-increasing GM and GE crops, a green revolution Mark II that has destroyed biodiversity, the soils and impoverished farmers globally. All to produce food deficient in nutrients and which waste vast resources. So to finish, in the run-up to COP and the imminent publication of the National Food Strategy, there has to be a major shake-up of food and agricultural production for the sake of people and planet. The Indian farmers are conveying that message and we need to amplify that voice at this time and to reflect upon our own vicariously delivered. Um, but I want to uh, pass the mic, if I'm allowed, to um, some groups that we've uh, uh, been working with this week. Um, and first of all, I want to pass it to XR Gauteng and XR Val in Southern Africa, who've written us a statement to pass to the G7 leaders. So, Andrew?